Hey, guys. So let's talk about server-side Swift using Vapor, or I guess continue talking about it. Um, so I know I'm the only thing standing between 300 uh, developers and some food, so I'll be quick. <laughs> um, so this is my GitHub handle and my Twitter handle and my website in case you want to get in contact with me. Um, so two years ago, I was working uh, at a startup here in New York as both an iOS developer and um, a back-end developer. And as I was working there, I was constantly jumping between using Swift for iOS and a scripted language for the back end. Um, and I kept wishing that I could use Swift on the back end. And perhaps due to some divine intervention, this was right when Swift was open sourced. And more importantly, uh, a Linux compatible uh, compiler was released. So I was really excited about that. And a little bit later, I uh, created Vapor. And now, due to some generous uh, sponsorship, we're able to work for, uh, full time on it uh, with four developers. So today, I want to talk um, first about using Swift as a back end, since a lot of you out there are iOS developers. Um, and then I want to talk about getting started with Vapor, what it looks like to use it, and then what it looks like to deploy it. Um, so why use a Swift web framework for your back end? Um, and this is you know, from the viewpoint of an iOS developer. Um, so there are a lot of great options to use for your back end. And I think kind of the best way to uh, compare and contrast them is with this chart that I created. So on the left, we have developer happiness, which is <laughs> kind of uh, an amalgamation of uh, how easy it is to get started, how easy it is to use. Um, and how easy it is to maintain. And that was obviously way too much to fit over there, so happiness. Uh, and then on the bottom, we have functionality. How much can you actually get done with this back end? Um, so to start off, we have the built-in frameworks. These are things that are actually built into the platform itself, um, like CloudKit or Game Center. And these are great because, obviously, they're really easy to set up. And they're going to feel native um, to use them because you know, they're part of the platform. Um, and they'll do the basics really well, but they're not going to do everything you need. If you need a really complex backend, um, you're probably uh, going to want something more. Um, and another big problem with these is that they're not cross-platform. So if you want your idea to end up supporting you know, Android or the web in the future, uh, you'll have to find something else for those platforms. So next we have backends as a service, or uh, backend as a services. I'll just call them backend services. And these are things like Firebase or Parse, um, which is no longer available as a service, but it kind of exemplifies this category well. Um, and these are great because they are cross-platform. So if you want to roll out to Android or the web, you can do that with these services. Um, but the problem now is that it's not exactly easy to be dry with these. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, dry is and do not repeat yourself. So let's say you have an iOS app, um, and you're using a back-end service, and you have some back-end logic on this app. So that could be things like uh, interacting with a database, uh, doing user auth, something like that. And now let's say you roll out a web version of the front end. So you also create the back end logic there, uh, the database queries, et cetera. So now you can see there's a bit of a problem. Now we have back end logic in two places. Um, so what happens if you need to change the structure of your database, which can totally happen in a, a production app? Now you have to change that in two places. Um, and you can imagine if you get an Android app now, that just exacerbates the problem. Um, what you really want is for your back-end logic to be in one place on the back-end, uh, and for the communication between your front-end and your back-end to be an abstraction layer, you know, an API. Um, but that's not exactly easy to do with these. So next, let's, uh, let's break out the big guns. We have the traditional web framework. So these are things like um, ExpressJS for Node and Ruby on Rails. So these can really do anything. Uh, you can execute arbitrary code on the server with these. Uh, and they can work with really any platform that supports HTTP. So should be everything at this point. You can use you know, JSON, protobuf, whatever you want to use. Um, but the problem here is twofold. Now we have to worry about uh, deploying and uh, maintaining our deployments, deploying our code. And that can be a huge pain. And then. Really what I think is the bigger problem is now we're not using Swift anymore. So now we're uh, you know, perhaps having to learn JavaScript or Ruby. Uh, we might need to get a new IDE for those. Uh, we might even need to install some sort of a VM on our computer to run them. Um, so that's really not ideal. And you can see, so with the current solutions, we have this unfortunate relation between 
how much you can actually do with the back end, um, and you know, how easy they are to use. Uh, so let's see what server-side Swift would look like. So we have all of the um, functionality of a web framework. Of course, they are web frameworks themselves. Uh, but now we get to use the same development environment. We're still using Swift. Uh, we're still using Xcode. And all of the skills that we've built over time on Xcode and Swift, we can continue to use here. So that's a huge win. Um, and the other big advantage is that it's really easy to be dry uh, with server-side Swift. So if your business logic, uh, like say your models or something, are written in Swift, you can actually break those out into separate packages um, and share those between your front end and your back end. Um, and what this does effectively is it allows you to uh, have the compiler type check the communication between your front end and your back end. Uh, and if anyone here has ever done any JSON parsing in an uh, iOS app, you'll know that that's really the code that you don't like to write. So this is really nice. And um, just think about you know, Codable and Swift 4, which I'll show you in a second. So let's say that that looks good to you and you think you want to use server-side Swift uh, for your app's back end, or perhaps you're a back end developer and you just want a more modern language. So how do you get started? The first thing you want is the Vapor Toolbox, which you guys actually saw uh, in the last presentation. So this is available on Mac OS and Ubuntu, really easy to install on both platforms. Uh, and on Ubuntu, it'll even install Swift for you, so that should make it really easy. Uh, and this will help you do anything that you would commonly want to do with a Vapor project, like you know, create a new project, uh, build, run, and test your projects, generate Xcode files, and even deploy. <clears throat> So this is what it looks like to create a new project. You put the name of the project, and then I'm passing the API flag here because I want to create a backend. Um, you can also create a front-end application that would be kind of an alternative to something like Angular, uh, but we'll stick with the backend example for now. And then Vapor Xcode to pull in the dependencies using SPM, and then it'll even open Xcode for you. So now we're back in Xcode, familiar Xcode, and we have our project files on the left, and some of the example code uh, included with the API template in the middle. Um, but instead of uh, opening up an iOS simulator or you know, a Mac OS app when you hit the play button, uh, it'll actually just open up the console right there. Uh, and it'll say the server is starting on localhost at some port. And so if we go over to Safari and we visit that, we can actually see our website right there. Uh, we didn't need to install any VMs or you know, Linux, uh, anything on our computer. It just works right in Xcode. So that's all you need to get started. Um, and the great part about being in Xcode is that we have all of the tools available to us that we know and love, like breakpoints. So if we set a breakpoint right here and then uh, go back to that page and visit it, the debugger will break out right there, um, and we can look at the request that we got and actually debug it. And you can see here the user agent is set to Safari, which is uh, what we visited this page with. So that is the development environment, Swift, Xcode, and the Vapor Toolbox. Um, so now, what does it look like to use Vapor? Uh, so I want to show you some new a, uh, APIs here, some stuff that's still in alpha development. So if, you, if you've used Vapor before, this uh, might be some new stuff, but hopefully I can show you some exciting new stuff coming. Um, so something you'll do very commonly in Vapor is routing. This is basically taking some identifying information from an HTTP request and routing it to your business logic. <coughs> So you can see the first example here. If someone does a git request to forward slash users, we should return a list of users. This is just a standard RESTful practice. If someone does post to articles 42 comments, we should create a comment for article 42. So this is what it looks like in Vapor. So first, of course, we want to import Vapor. And then next, we're going to create an application. And an application is a service container, and it holds your configuration. Um, so this is really useful, uh, as we see on the third line, for creating things that you need uh, in your application while you're using Vapor. So on line three, we ask the app to make a router. Um, and the router is not actually a concrete type. It's a protocol. And it declares all of the things that you need to be a router. Um, so this is really important because this does two things. One is um, <clears throat> it makes it really easy to uh, swap out your components. So if you want to use a different router, perhaps uh, your backend would uh, be more efficient with a different algorithm. Uh, you might want to use that router. Um, but the second thing is testing. So if our application just uses a router protocol to register all of its routes, then we could devise a unit test that 
uh, goes through and puts in a test router that just, you know, adds all the routes registered to an array. And then we can give it that test router and assert that that array contained what we expected. So really useful. Uh, we then use the router that we got, and since, you know, there's no custom configuration here, we're just gonna get the default uh, tri-node router. And uh, we're going to register uh, using git users, you can see it just mirrors what's above, uh, and we give it a closure that accepts a request and returns a response. And we're using Fluent to get all users, which I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, and then we run the app, uh, and that's it. That's a full application. So Fluent is an ORM created by uh, the core team, and this lets you fetch and persist data, create and migrate schema, so it's similar to what core data would do um, for you. And it also supports querying and advanced querying like computed fields, joins, aggregates, all with a really nice Swift syntax. Uh, you can do transactions, so that's like saving a bunch of things, but if one of them fails, you want to undo everything. Um, and also raw querying. So Fluent supports both SQL and NoSQL alike. Uh, so things like MySQL and MongoDB, you know, Postgres. So sometimes you might want to get access to those layers um, underneath like a trivial example is you want to select the version of MySQL you're using. In those cases, Fluent makes it really easy to you know, get out of your way and let you uh, access that layer. So this is what it looks like to fetch data using uh, Fluent. So <laughs> we have a cartoon character model here, and I'll show you what it looks like on the next slide, but since it conforms to model, we uh, can call make query on that and get a query for cartoon characters. We can then add filters to that using the convenience operator syntax we have here, and then just call dot all, and we get an array of cartoon characters. Very simple. So this is what the model looks like. We have just a basic uh, Swift class here. Uh, I'm declaring it final, so I don't have to worry about required in its or anything. That's not required. Um, and then we have three basic properties, string, uh, name, age, and a catchphrase. And then we put on there just a storage object, and this allows Fluent to maintain some internal state on your object, like was it fetched from the database, was it not? Um, and then we have our parsing and serialization code for uh, taking our object from the database and putting it to the database. And this is fairly easy to implement, but luckily with Swift 4 and Codable, we don't need that anymore. So really easy to declare. Yes, <laughs> thank you whoever implemented Codable uh, at Apple. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's really great. Um, so now I want to talk about Leaf. So Leaf is a templating uh, language that, again, the Vapor Core team wrote. And it allows you to render data to HTML. And this is obviously useful if you're creating a website with a lot of HTML pages. But even if you're creating a backend, this can be useful uh, for uh, generating emails. Uh, like if someone signs up, they get, you know, like, welcome to our thing. So uh, this supports expressions and for and if else sugar that is very similar to what you'd get in Swift. So if you're used to Swift, you'll feel right at home in Leaf. And it supports nested templates, which I'll show you, and um, lazy and async. And lazy and async is really cool, and it's something that we're adding. It's not out yet, but it's in the next release. And it's something that I don't think any other templating language has. Um, and so let's imagine we have uh, in our template a block of code and an if block. Um, so if this resolves to true, we're going to display uh, what is in that block. And now imagine in there, we're looping over you know, some users from the database. So what happens if that if block resolves to false and you know, that never gets displayed? Well, since Leaf is lazy, it'll actually never even make that database call in the first place, uh, which can make big applications really performant. So this is what it looks like to render data to HTML. On the left, I have the uh, example from earlier, but now I've added in uh, a request to the app to create a view renderer. And this is assuming the app is uh, configured to use Leaf. You can use anything like stencil, uh, markdown, mustache, whatever you want. Uh, so we ask uh, the app for a view renderer, and then we use that view renderer to make a view named welcome, and we give it a string string context uh, with name equal to vapor. So our template on the right here, we just use the uh, simple echo syntax and we echo out the name. Uh, so this will resolve to hello vapor. Uh, this is what nested templates look like. So on the left we have the base template. Uh, it's expecting a title and some content. And then on the right we export the title, export the content, and then import that base template. 
And what's great about this way of doing nested templates is if you look at that template on the left, that's actually just a normal template. Uh, so we could use that with a string string uh, dictionary and you know plug in values normally there. A lot of templating language uh, languages will use you know like an import base extend uh, type of metaphor, uh, and so you can't use them as regular templates. So this is a really nice feature. And that's what the page looks like. And if you create a uh, new Vapor app with the web flag, this will be the, the page that you get. So there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that I wish I had time to talk about, and a bunch of stuff, uh, services that we support officially. These are in the main uh, Vapor repo, so the core team will you know, put bug fixes on these and uh, feature requests. And there are a whole bunch of other things I didn't include on here that the community supports, um, like a couple big ones are Stripe and S3. Um, but I want to quickly talk about deploying. So as you guys saw, Heroku is a very popular way to deploy your app. Um, and as I heard last night at the speaker dinner, this is how a lot of people do it, and it works well for them. And you can use the uh, Heroku command in the CLI tool to do this. It's just two commands. First time you need to init your project for Heroku, and then the second time you can push it. Um, and also, IBM Bluemix is a great option. So if you don't already know, IBM created Katura, which is another server-side Swift web framework. And uh, so they know what they're doing in terms of you know, running Swift on <clears throat> the server. And we've actually worked with them to make sure that Vapor runs well here. So that's another good option. Um, last but not least, though, is Vapor Cloud. So this is something that the Vapor core team has created. Uh, and this loops back to maintenance being one of the hard parts about using uh, a web framework for your back end. And our goal with this was to make uh, deploying your code and maintaining those deployments as easy as possible. Um, you know, deploying your code can at best be a chore and at worst be just utterly arcane. So we really wanted to change that and make uh, deploying a web framework as easy as using a built-in backend. So we built Vapor Cloud on top of AWS and since we know exactly what we're running on there, we're running Vapor projects on there, we can do a lot of smart things. Like, uh, for instance, have Swift pre-installed, which you know, a lot of hosting uh, solutions don't have. So that's like you know, five minutes every time you deploy to download and uh, unpack that. Uh, we can also do some cool stuff like a uh, feature we're working on now intelligently analyzes the configuration of your Vapor setup and can see things like you're using a MySQL database. So we help you get a MySQL database set up and automatically inject the things you need for MySQL. So no more worrying about like what's the host name, you know, what's MySQL's port again. All of that's just taken care of. We again have a command line tool for this similar to Heroku. And uh, this is in open beta right now, so if you want to try this out, you can. It's totally free to use right now during the beta phase. And just one uh, command to deploy. If, it, if it's your uh, first time deploying, it'll kind of walk you through the process of getting set up. And we have a dashboard as well. And this was all written in Vapor, both the API and the front end. Um, and you can, use, uh, you can like check out analytics and stuff on here. It's really nice. And so just quickly to go back to um, this slide here, hopefully with Vapor and Vapor Cloud together, we can combine the uh, functionality of a web framework with the simplicity of a built-in backend. And here are some links I want to point you to. Uh, so that's our website, and our Slack is vapor.team. We just welcomed our 4,000th member, uh, and so that's a great place to go if you want to talk about server-side Swift or just want to hang out with uh, fellow Swift nerds. Thank you.